lecture that you attended. <coughs> the Tetley series was actually funded about 22 years ago by Tetley T. That's where that name comes from. And it was, it was established for two primary reasons. First and foremost, we wanted our students to have the opportunity to interact with and to hear from a great business leader in the Atlanta community. Number two is we wanted that great business leader to have the opportunity to come to our beautiful campus. And so it's an opportunity for our students to learn, for you to learn, but also an opportunity to show you off and to show our campus off. And um, I'm, I'm very thankful today that Steve has chosen to join us. And I'll introduce Steve in just a few moments. I do want to introduce a few folks today. First of all, most of you are the leaders from four different classes. And so I want to Let's make sure this working too loud, okay? I want to thank thank you all for uh, inviting me to be a part of this today. <clears throat> um, in early in my career, I got a chance to teach CPAs, and for 14 years, I would uh, have every CPA in a national firm come through Chicago, where I was one of the teaching crew. And what always interested me were seeing bright eyes enthusiasm and interest out of the people who were in the audience. Unfortunately, in my topic, which was teaching CPAs how to be business advisors, I looked out over primarily disinterested eyes going, I'm an auditor, I don't do that. I'm a tax guy, what's he talking about? So you, you look for that occasional spark, that occasional, gosh, I'd really like to help people, and those became the people that you talked to. So. I always enjoy uh, 
standing in front of people who are early in their development, early in their career, and who have a lot of enthusiasm and ambition about the future. What I'm going to do today is talk a little bit in structure and a little bit in anecdote, just sharing experiences, but also sharing some things that I think might have an interest to you being early in your career. Who I am is part of the present and a veteran of the past. And I'm going to share some thoughts and insights about the past. Who you are are members of the present and our future. So you are who we will become, both in business, in society, and in our culture. You are the future. I'm still involved and still active and, and uh, in the middle of many things, but I recognize that, uh, that my role in that <clears throat> isn't at an end, but it's certainly not in the beginning, and you are. So I think that uh, being able to share some of the experiences of uh, what I've experienced and seen over the past 40 years might have some value to you. Um, I started my career as a, um, well actually I, going back I'm an Atlanta native, went to grammar school on Peachtree Road down in Buckhead, went to Northside High School which is on Northside Drive in, in Buckhead as well, then went off to Duke University in North Carolina and met a whole lot of people from the north which was very disconcerting, and then came back here and did my graduate work at Georgia State. Now at the time, Georgia State was the primary uh, academic institution that would allow for somebody to work in a job part-time and uh, or even full-time and go to school at night. Later on, as we were building the firm, I began recruiting here at Kennesaw, and our firm has a long history of being here as HLB Gross Collins interviewing accounting students and bringing them into our staff. So we have been cheerleaders of Kennesaw for a long time and, and it, really, it really amazes me to see what this school has become. The facilities, the talent, the leadership, the vision, um, extraordinary. So later on in my career I became <clears throat> a CPA I joined an international accounting firm, became a teacher and an advisor in that, in that national firm, ultimately became national director of business consulting, which meant that my job was to figure out what CPAs could do in the 10 months that they weren't doing audits and tax. How can you be valuable? How can you charge hourly rates? How can you do something for business they're going to want you to do and that they'll pay for? So figuring out how to be an advisor, how to help businesses grow was the uh, skill and talent we tried to share within the accounting uh, firm at the time. Ultimately, our firm merged with bigger firms and it disappeared from the landscape. We bought the rights to the uh, southeast region from those firms and became a private accounting firm in Cobb County. And for a long time, we were the largest accounting firm in Cobb County. I think we're now um, probably in second place. There's uh, another firm that's doing a great job uh, but we're still um, heavily involved with Cobb County in Atlanta, and we have about 100 CPAs up in uh, the Old Russell building behind the Georgia, uh, the Georgian Bank, which is now for citizens on Cobb, Cobb Boulevard, right at Northside Parkway. So we've been a citizen of Cobb County for a long time and, and love being part of it. Um, part of what I wanted to share today in my career as a CPA, some of my early clients have strong ties with Kennesaw. One of my first clients a long, long time ago was a young lawyer who aspired to be, to do work in the entertainment world. At the time I met him, he was uh, teaching school at Georgia State, um, uh, basically teaching entertainment law. Didn't have any entertainment clients, but he was teaching entertainment law on the hope that one day he would. And he was going to the drunk tanks at night and handing out his cards to DUI <laughs> guys and working up uh, some, some revenue that way. And uh, uh, I remember when he called me and said, Steve, we've got our first entertainment client. And I said, okay, who is it? He says, well, it's this uh, soul singer, this guy named James Brown. 
And I went, oh, that's really cool. James Brown, Godfather of Soul. Probably a year before then, I had gone to the Atlanta Stadium and had been in the, uh, a sold out concert with James Brown and the Famous Flames, and there had to have been 70,000 people there. Um, so it was interesting to suddenly have him have a entertainment client and that we shared. So my job was to keep his business affairs straight, and I think the highlight of that representation was negotiating a six million dollar tax lien that he owed the government. I got it eliminated for twenty thousand dollars and a promise to pay three percent of his income for the next ten years. And the reason that the government did that is that there was a lot of rioting going on and civil unrest, and they wanted him to go around the country singing free concerts and calm down um, his followers. <clears throat> and so he was going to do that. It just really excited him to do it, period. And I said, no, 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 you can't do it free. And they said, oh, you mean I think I can get something for it? I said, let me go up to Washington and see what we can do about these tax liens. So ultimately, we settled his past tax bills, over $6 million, for a very small amount of money. But that's how that, that world works. The, uh, the second client that we shared was uh, a uh, emerging uh, country singer, um, an unknown guy named Willie Nelson, who uh, had never had a hit, had been running around Nashville in, in his mid-40s, still trying to break out. And he came to, uh, came to uh, us and said, you know, I don't have any money, I can't pay for you, but if you'll do my work uh, and negotiate this contract, I've got two albums coming out. The first one was Red Headed Stranger and the second one was Stardust. He says, I think they're going to be hits. And if you do my work on the come, then I'll uh, introduce you to everybody in Nashville. And that worked out. Ultimately, though, I lost the account from the financial side because as soon as he became popular and Dan Rather was going, Willie Nelson's my favorite artist and Stardust is the best album in history and he was sudden, suddenly getting this kind of national acclaim, <clears throat> Price Waterhouse uh, showed up and said, Willie, you're going to be our client. And Willie said, well, why would I be your client? I like Steve. And he says, well, Willie, you'll never pay taxes with us. <laughs> Fifteen years later, the IRS shows up and takes everything that Willie owns, including his hats, his belts, pictures of Connie on the dresser, his underwear, his dresser, and the only thing that he saves was that ratty guitar that he still plays on stage with the hole in it. He saved that, and that's the reason he still plays it today, as remembrance of that time. Later on, he won a judgment against Pricewaterhouse for $26 million, which cleared him up with the IRS and put him back into a relatively stable position. But uh, it showed me how fragile that whole market is, and through the years uh, representing athletes and entertainers, it's a very difficult thing to get involved in. That individual that I represented back in those days is now one of the most powerful entertainment lawyers in the country. His name's Joel Katz, and he is uh, the namesake on your arts program here at Kennesaw State, and still has a uh, deep commitment to Kennesaw, to learning, to law, and to the entertainment industry. He's one of Michael Jackson's trustees for his estate, uh, was the founder of the Grammys and the Country Music Awards, and is is quite a, a force of nature, and, you're, and uh, it's a great honor for both Joel to be part of Kennesaw State and for Kennesaw State to have Joel as a part of here. <clears throat> Another individual who I had the opportunity to uh, serve with was Michael Coles. And Michael, um, Michael and I served on bank boards together. We, f we formed a bank here in Cobb County and grew it, ultimately merged it with Synovus. And Michael loves to tell the story of how he started out and working various jobs and working in the hospitality industry and finally he got backing for and conceived of opening up a cookie shop. And the first cookie shop was going to be at Perimeter Mall. So all of his friends and family and all of his initial investors are at Perimeter Mall for the grand opening of the Great American Cookie Company. So Michael and his partner are back in the back 
putting the dough into the ovens and, and tr cranking them up and uh, all the investors are out there and they're smelling this cookie dough cook and God, it's just a marvelous smell and everybody can't wait to eat the cookies. And then Michael, to his horror, realized that these commercial ovens, he didn't know how to open them. They were cooking, but he didn't know how to get the cookies out. So they're fooling with, with the ovens and trying to get them open and they can't figure out how to open the latches. And suddenly that wonderful smell of cookie dough cooking turns into flames and smoke. And the entire mall fills up with this thick smoke of burnt cookies. And that was the start of Mike Cole's <clears throat> Great American Cookie Company. So even in the best of circumstances, you can have an abject failure and have it be totally out of your control. So from that point, Michael has gone on to a fabulous career, <clears throat> built Great American Cookie Company into a national franchise, has been part of the political and business scene of Cobb County and of Kennesaw ever since, and is a wonderful presence. I'll give you two other experiences that were notable out of many in our, in our business's career. <clears throat> we were representing uh, a company out of Chicago, Guernsey, Illinois, called Handy Andy Home Improvement. And Handy Andy, at the time we were representing them, we started with one store, we were at about 15, spreading through the Midwest. And uh, uh, some people that we knew in the business, the executives of a big chain called Handy Dan, suddenly realized that their parent was going bankrupt. and. On a Friday afternoon, the three founders of, or the three executives with Handy Dan found themselves with pink slips. They were fired, no severance, no, you know, continuing consulting contracts. It's clean your desk out, we'll have security walk you to the parking lot, thanks, good luck with your life. And these three guys are having breakfast on Monday morning at the Waffle House over here on Cobb Parkway going, what in the hell are we going to do with the rest of our life? And they knew that we were working with Handy Andy. It's a very close community. All these home improvement companies know each other. So we had got a phone call from, uh, from Bernie Marcus, Arthur Blank, and Ron Brill. And they came in and said, Steve, we want to start up a new company. <clears throat> and we know you've got Handy Andy. You've just raised a lot of money for them to expand and we'd like to know if you'd like to finance our first few stores and be our partner. We said, that sounds like a great idea, we'd love to. And we started going down the path of opening up that first store and ultimately what happened is that a fellow named Ken Langone came down from New York and said, we're not about, you're not about to let that competitor finance you and be your partner. I'm gonna take you public and we're gonna go buy them. So he talked Bernie and Arthur out of um, allowing us to finance the early Home Depot stores, went public, and we wound up representing both Bernie and Arthur personally during that whole time. So we were doing all of their personal financial work, keeping the two companies aligned so they could merge if it ever made sense down the road. Six, eight years later, they come back, let's merge. And so we work up a, a, a deal to put the two companies together. And over the weekend, the Home Depot stock got volatile and our guys wanted more shares because the stock had gone down. They were, Bernie and Arthur said, no, we can't do that. The stock will come back. So the deal didn't happen. And Handy Andy ultimately wound up being sold to other people and Home Depot kept going. Well, that relationship with Arthur and Bernie led to a long fruitful relationship and I wound up being uh, for good and for bad. Uh, hired by Arthur to represent Mike Vick and to be his personal business manager and financial uh, support system, which was a wonderful relationship for three years. I've got to say he was a sweet, caring, nice, well put together young man um, who happened to have eight or nine uh, members of the posse hanging around, it seemed like, at all times in every place. And ultimately, Arthur you know, said to Michael, uh, you know, Michael, you've outgrown these street friends of yours. You need to develop your own life and not be so dependent on and having these guys hang around. 
because they were being arrested every weekend with drugs driving one of Michael's cars. And the lawyers were constantly trying to get these, the entourage out of trouble. So ultimately when it blew up and the dog fighting that was occurring in Virginia showed up, Arthur didn't know about it, I didn't know about it, his people in Virginia didn't know about it, but the posse did. And it brought him down and caused him great, great shame. Uh, very tragic to watch. And I kept saying to, to, to Michael, why can't you be more like Tiger Woods? <laughs> <laughs> Little did I know what that would turn into. <laughs> the final, <clears throat> final story I'll give you in terms of clients and experiences was um, I was introduced to a 25-year-old entrepreneur who was um, being kind of taken around Atlanta by a mentor, a fellow named Yoko Rissanen, and Yoko was a uh, medical device guy that came out of Medtronic's heart um, defibrillator company. And he had a vision of doing, uh, of helping heart doctors issue medical devices to heart patients, check them out, check them back in, and set up some technology where these uh, heart uh, machines could be uh, you could put a telephone on top of them, they'd automatically call into a call center, the, a nurse would read the EKG and see whether the patient was having a heart problem or not, and then tell him, be calm, we've got an ambulance on the way, or take an aspirin, you know, hype, calm down, you're okay, nothing's wrong. But it was a remote monitoring of heart patients through medical devices. And that company became quite a profitable company, 25 million in sales, six, seven million dollars in profits. <clears throat> so we decided back in the mid 90s, let's take this company public. Everybody's going public, we can go public. And uh, so we brought in all of the uh, Robinson Humphrey, we brought in uh, uh, Wheat Securities, we brought in Wachovia, we brought in Ro Robinson Stevenson, and all the, the fellows that, that what they call run books that take companies public. They're sitting down with us going, well, we can uh, maybe raise you $25 million for 20, 30% of your company, but tell us about this technology. And we told them about the automatic phone call creating a fax that got sent to the cardiac doctor. And we started talking about, uh, you know, why don't we do email? And, uh, and we said, well, we don't do email because doctors don't have computers. Well, how can we get them computers? And at the time, and this is back in the late 90s, there was a little device you could buy and hook it up to your television, and it would connect it to the internet with a 56K baud modem, which none of you guys know what it is. But think about snail mail slowed down. It's uh, incredibly primitive communication technology, but it would connect you to the internet. So we went out and signed a contract with the company making these devices, and they were called web TVs. And we said, we're gonna buy 10,000 of them, and we're gonna hook them up and sell them to doctors, and we're gonna do a portal, a medical portal for the doctors that will educate them, entertain them, um, will share medical files, none of which was practical, by the way. An EKG file over a 56K bottom, baud modem would, would have taken three hours. But None of us was thinking that that was a problem. So we named this company WebMD. We went out and spent $25,000 buying the rights to the name. <clears throat> now the, the underwriters, the uh, Wall Street firms are going, ah, now you got something. This profitable company making six, seven million dollars a year, eh, who cares about that? This web company is gonna make you rich. Hundreds of millions of dollars. So they advised us to sell that profitable company, which we did to a Cobb County entrepreneur named uh, Pete Petit, who was running a company called Matry at the time, raised $20 million selling it, reinvested it in creating this web portal, got more investors, wound up at $40, 50 million million of other people's money invested in this idea company. And we were running out of cash. We, had, we figured we had about six weeks left before we had to shutter the doors and just, you know, take our ball and go home. So it was kind of a Hail Mary. Um, the entrepreneur flew out with his uh, COO to Redmond, Washington, to Microsoft. 
cold call. You know, hi, I'm uh, WebMD and we want to talk. So he walks in and there's uh, what they call screeners listening to all these harebrained ideas and they'd have about six to eight presentations a day. They'd get glassy eyed in about 15 minutes and just cycle them through. There'd maybe be 30 or 40 of them a day that would come through Microsoft offices. And the, and the little, and the, the uh, uh, assigned MBAs to hear the pitch would hear and make, you know, little notes on the pad. So um, WebMD's in there talking with one of these screeners and the conference room door opens up. Steve Ballmer sticks his head in and says, who are you guys? They said, WebMD, what's your space? Medical portal, where are you from? Atlanta, thanks, closes the door and that's it. <clears throat> Two weeks later, my guys having come home saying, well, we got a month to go and we're bankrupt, that didn't go too well. A month later, uh, Ballmer's office calls and says, we're in, $150 million. And everybody goes, what? Suddenly, out of nowhere, you know, heaven drops a gift. And the way it works out there, and, and I, I live part-time on the West Coast and am involved with Sand Hill Road and Silicon Valley. The way it works is that uh, uh, Redmond put out an announcement that they've made a commitment for this WebMD medical space company. And that, that buzz cycled down to Silicon Valley almost overnight. <clears throat> and a fellow named Jim Clark, who had taken Netscape public and was one of the real, you know, heavy hitters in uh, Silicon Valley, had started a company named Healthion, taken it public, thought it was going to be another Google, another Amazon, another, you know, everything out there went public at five and was 50 by the end of the day. This one went public at seven and was at seven six months later. So he's sitting on a failure in his eyes and he said, who in the heck is this uh, Atlanta company, WebMD? So he sent his COO to Atlanta to figure out who they were, and if there was a deal to be done, make a deal. So he shows up in Atlanta, over probably 20 margaritas sitting around the pool with uh, the two moguls, you know, negotiating with each other. They come up with a 50-50 deal, and WebMD will be merged into Healthion that gets announced and the stock of Healthion goes from 7 to 70 overnight. Now at the time, WebMD was being run by a 27-year-old entrepreneur, a couple of years of age now. Uh, it had less than a million dollars of trailing revenue and it was valued at four and a half billion dollars. So we were witnessing the internet bubble on steroids. And I'm sitting there going, all of my training is worthless, all of my grounding has no value because I've never seen numbers like this and these people are crazy. But it happened and it made a lot of people in Atlanta very, very wealthy. The entrepreneur, a young man named Jeff Arnold, is now back in it again and he works for Discovery Channel now and his WebMD follow-up is a company called ShareCare ShareCare is a web portal, medical information, subscription service, and it's his partners in that are Dr. Oz, Oprah, Sony, and Discovery Channel. So he's now 40, I believe, and he's doing it again in a bigger way with more high profile players. So it just points out that <clears throat> good ideas, well executed, and persistence in the right space can turn into a very profitable company. So those, those are experiences that I got to see firsthand. There are many, many others, but those I thought might resonate a little bit with you and you might have seen that come and go and been part of your business ex or your, your experience. I want to, um, um, so just as the only point to that is who I am. I've seen a lot of businesses, I've experienced a lot, uh, and I wanted to share that as kind of a grounding for what I'm, what I'm going to talk about now. What I'd like to talk about are five different things. What the basic language and principles of business are, 
the process of growing a healthy business, the skills and tools you need to succeed, the need to measure and manage everything around you, and the role of capitalism in free enterprise, which I think is always important to refresh ourselves on how we fit, what we do, why it's, why it's a noble endeavor, and why it's something that we should be proud of when we do it. Now the basic ways to get wealthy are marry it, <coughs> inherit it, game the system, or spend less than you make, save and invest the difference. Personally and for a business, these are the only ways to succeed and, get, and build wealth. When I say game it, gaming it to me means crime, corruption, cronyism, and force. And you can get wealthy by being good at any of those, but it's not something that, in my opinion, is something that anyone should be proud of. And when we see it around us, it offends us. So I'm going to focus on the fourth. <clears throat> The basic metaphor I like to use in business is you've got to look at any business as a living organism. It's no different than uh, anything that lives and has a life cycle. And for this metaphor, I'll use a tree. And a tree basically starts out as a seedling and winds up growing mass over time by uh, depending upon organic processes. Same thing for a business. We begin with uh, rooting the tree in healthy soil. For a business to thrive, it's got to live in a stable economy and a thriving industry. Whenever you have economies that are volatile, businesses are in jeopardy and they're fragile. If you're in a thriving industry, you've got a chance. If you want to come up with the next grocery store, it probably doesn't make sense to open it up next to a Publix or a Walmart or a uh, Kroger because they've done it. They do it better than you're ever going to do it. So it's not a thriving industry to try and pull something like that off. <clears throat> the next step is you've got to feed the roots. You've got to give it sustenance. And feeding the roots for business is capital, invested risk money that says, I'm going to be patient and I'm going to wait for this thing to work. Financing, which is available when you leverage capital to get bank loans or other kinds of financing. And profits. Profits add the momentum that it takes to grow. <clears throat> the enablers for healthy growth, the things that make the, uh, the organism work are leadership, collaboration, communication, and technology. When you have the proper balance of these items working together in growing a business, you have a chance for it to get stronger. But, but it needs each of these elements. Strengthening the trunk, running it well, is the planning, executing, and evaluating of everything that you do. Plan it, do it, figure out how well you did it, make corrective actions, and keep moving, keep going through the process. So key performance indicators and business intelligence are ways of taking snapshots of what you're doing to track the things that are most important. But you've got to do that over and over again in a business in order to figure out when you're off track and how to fix it. Figure out things that are going better than you expected and take advantage of it. But you've got to be doing these things to be sensitive to that. Growth and, growth and thriving, the fruits of the tree are created when customers, employees are happy, motivated, and involved. And when you're performing at your optimum, you're making profits, and your operating processes are best of breed. So you're constantly judging yourself in terms of these outcomes to see whether or not it's working well. And that's the basic life cycle of a business. Now, <clears throat> now, in terms of each of you individually, how is it that you can go through a career and succeed? And I wanted to make these points not as uh, obvious things, but to say there is a process to it. You start by working hard. And what working hard means 
is learning the skills, learning the techniques, becoming a competent uh, uh, producer of whatever the activity is that you've chosen. If you're a painter, if you're a doctor, if you're a lawyer, if you're a businessman, you've got to learn your skill, learn your craft. And the process of working hard is accelerating the process, accelerating the growth into the stage where you're really good at what you do. So you can take 20 years to learn your craft and you don't have to work so hard. But if you want to work hard and be competent in three to five years, that's where you accelerate and have to put the effort in. But the first step in any career is to be good at what you do, whatever it is that you do. The second stage is working smart. Now that you're good at what you do, you've got to scale yourself. You've got to do more than you can physically do on your own. And the only way to do that is with team, is to build people to support you around you, being able to replicate what you know and how you know how to do it with others, which means that you've got to attract them, you've got to train them, you've got to teach them, you've got to supervise them. And then you start creating scale. And you do this, and that's the process of growing a company, but it's also growing your impact on your space. So you can become more impactful by spreading yourself through others and taking a bigger and bigger slice of whatever pie that you're involved in. But you can't work smart until you know what you're doing because you don't want to spread bad habits or misinformation. You've got to really be good before you can replicate yourself. Good example of this is any franchise business. Great American Cookie Company. Good example. I'll bet that never after that first store did any other store have a hard time getting cookies out of the oven. They figured out how to do that pretty quick. And once they were running a really profitable store in Perimeter, they could branch out and go to Cumberland. They could go to Town Center. They could go around the south. They could go out into the country. But they had to learn how to do it well themselves before they could teach others how to do it. Same principle applies in growing a business. So work hard first, master your craft, then work smart and scale yourself. The third is become a master of your domain. And what that means is have other people know that you are that bright light in your space. So you start spreading yourself around, teach, um, sh uh, show up at trade shows, become a leader in your trade associations or whatever the groups are that, uh, that, that work around you. Have other people know about you, your team, your company, and how they fit into the industry. So you become a master of your domain with a bright light shining on your efforts. And that starts the process of word of mouth. Beyond the customers that you have, other people now recognize you for your expertise or your skills and that creates a uh, growth pattern of its own. Network among peers and interested consumers. This is where advertising, marketing, and outreach that isn't direct start occurring. Again, spreading the word, spreading your credibility, sharing the reputation on larger and larger playground so that you can grow into those playgrounds as well. And the last point is persist, persist, persist. Don't ever give up. Don't worry about failure. I've learned in my personal career that failure always teaches me more than success does. I get really lazy in success. I start thinking about, gosh, maybe I'll play golf two or three times this weekend. Maybe I'll uh, head home around six and hang out and, you know, kind of have a few cocktails and visit with the guys. Maybe I can take a few, few weeks off and travel a bit more. I start, I start taking for granted the success that seems to get easier and easier. But when you fail, it snaps you right back to reality. You've got to pay attention. You've got to keep going. You've got to keep planning. You've got to keep uh, figuring out how to work smart. And it doesn't mean that you sacrifice your personal life at all. What I've found <clears throat> for myself in the last 15 years is I made a commitment to become virtual. I wanted to be just as effective no matter where I was in the world as I was in my office 
when I was cracking the whip and running around everybody's cubicle to see what they were doing. So I started developing uh, processes and learning technologies. Today it's almost, I mean, I'm sure every one of you is uh, uh, operating off of a smartphone with central data, with uh, Dropbox, with uh, recorded uh, class notes and all kinds of things that are the realities of being virtual today. But you can also run companies that way. And you can be on the back of that boat hauling in the sailfish, deep sea fishing, as your secretary is saying, would you approve these checks? Would you uh, look at this report and give me feedback? And would you get ready for Monday morning's meeting? You can do all that at the same time today. So it, it opens up a prospect of having a company where you're in Atlanta, your partner's in New York, you have a, a third partner in Chicago, and you have a fourth quality control guy in China. That's it. And you can do $100 million on four people distributed around to a customer base and a supply chain base and not have any more employees than that. I'm seeing it happen a lot. So the rules of the past where you had a central core like a, like a beehive and you kept adding more and more bees and you got a bigger beehive and you created more and more complexity and systems and process in a central location, technologies come and whacked with a baseball bat the beehive and now the bees are everywhere. But if you know how to use technologies in that, in that environment, you can create big, big activity centers and not have a central core. So technology is now helping all of us. <clears throat> this goes back to my accounting, and I'm, I'm gonna plug accounting for a minute because accounting is where I learned how, what the machinery of business was. It wasn't so much about debits and credits and general ledgers and financial statements and filling out forms and doing compliance reports. All of that is to me what I call commodity accounting. It's the traditional world where you have a lot of transactions which lead to information and you do a report. That's the world that accounting used to live in and own and, and it's now being taken away from it. <clears throat> With automated platforms and trusted CFO solutions is a company that helps business move into automated and virtual platforms. All of this is done digitally. The transactions being converted to information, being turned into reports, happens with very little manual touch. So the industry of doing that with people and with computers and with applications is going away. It's being commoditized. So those people who depend upon accounting in that world are finding themselves more and more of a commodity and being replaced. The world of value, though, is in taking the information, distilling it into insights. What does all this stuff mean? What should I look at and pay attention to? What do I need to change? What do I need to act upon? That is a very valuable thing to do and to understand for a business owner. So he is very much involved in the insights and then action part of his business. And for accountants that are coming up through the accounting school, if you focus your career development on taking information, turning it into insights, and then translating that to management so they can act, and you become part of that corrective action process, you will be a highly paid, extremely valuable, groomed for leadership, part of management. I will guarantee you. <clears throat> if you think that hiding from people, being in a cubicle, having your computer, adding up uh, uh, tapes, putting information into QuickBooks, once a month reconciling the bank and coming up with a financial report, if you think that is your career, that's a dead end. Eight years ago, in fact, maybe 10 years ago now, Tom Friedman wrote a book called The World is Flat. And he predicted in that book, in chapter one, that the traditional CPA was dead. He was gone. No longer useful. No longer necessary. Because India was pumping out a quarter of a million MBA CPA graduates a year, and they were working for $1,000 a month in India and with big pipes going back and forth, 
businesses could run during the day, all their information could go to India at night, come back for next to nothing the next day, and all the accounting's done. He predicted the right thing, but for the wrong reason. People don't trust their information going overseas to strangers. But very quickly, that cheap labor was replaced by digital platforms and processes that do it without people at all today. His conclusion was correct. He was ahead of his time, and he had the wrong reasons for it, but it's just as correct today as it was when he said that eight to 10 years ago. <clears throat> so if you're in the accounting world, look to becoming part of the decision-making financial analysis and financial management part of business, not the compliance, accounting, and reporting side of business. <clears throat> Why do we do this? I mean, what's the point of it all? Part of, to me, succeeding in life and succeeding in a business is seeing the direct result of your efforts turning into an achievement, a success, <coughs> Uh, a, a really positive event. And I've seen over and over again as I've worked with young companies and young entrepreneurs, you're with them, they're struggling, they're in the early stages, they start growing, they get bigger, five or 10 years go by, they built a company of value, they sell it, their whole family's life changes. Very often they're too young to retire, so they come back and do it again. And I'm in my third and fourth time at bat with many of these entrepreneurs because they love achieving. They love succeeding. They love the feeling of being good at something and doing it over and over again. It's more the reward of the achievement than it is the money. And I've seen people lose enormous amounts of money and not care and come back and do it again because it was never about the money. It was about building. It was about motivating. It was about uh, uh, expanding and succeeding and seeing the eyes of delighted clients and orchestrating a transaction where uh, a lot of value had been created. So that's, that's a reason. I believe that self-esteem, which is a very misused word these days, especially in education uh, at the grammar school and K through 12 level, self-esteem's earned through pride and accomplishment. Knowing you had a challenge, meeting the challenge, achieving success in that challenge, that creates self-esteem. You can't designate self-esteem. We're gonna all have self-esteem because we're no longer gonna have an A through F system. We're gonna have pass-fail. In fact, we're not gonna have pass-fail, we're gonna have pass. Come to KSU, everybody passes. Well, you might feel good, I passed. But there's not an employer on the planet that's gonna look at any one of those students because he can't determine quality. He can't determine ambition. He can't determine uh, skill in the marketplace. That becomes a dead zone. Can't evaluate talent where there isn't an opportunity to achieve and succeed based upon personal effort. It is impossible. So the idea of, of taking away the reality of self-worth, of personal achievement, of, of hard work and the results that come from that puts you in a dead zone. In that dead zone, you will never be competitive, you will never succeed because you don't have any grounding in it. You just assume everybody succeeds and it can't work that way. Another why is that through building a business or being a master of your craft, you wind up creating a better life for yourself, for the team that you build, for the customers and your own family. So you become the change agent around whom you watch people's lives change. Suddenly your family is more cohesive, going to, to good schools, you're, you're being a mentor to your children. Your employees are growing and you're seeing career development. In 40 years, I've seen so many people come in as 21-year-old graduates. At 30, they're, they're fabulous professionals. At 40, they're, they're uh, important in big companies. At 50, they're running Fortune 100 companies or have started their own companies and have sold their first company out of the box. And that's very satisfying for me 
being part of their life, their progress, their achievements. So that's another reward that you get in being engaged in the process of business. And <clears throat> contributing to your community from the rewards of your success. We're watching now a big societal conflict, whether or not charities and personal um, responsibility for other people's uh, uh, improvement and taking care of others should be us or should it be the state? There's a lot of debate on both sides of that. But America became great because personal achievement was rewarded. Those personal rewards were turned into wealth. The wealth was shared with others. And there's a network of, of charities and of people who are deeply concerned with the, with the situations of others. And I look at Bernie Marcus with the aquarium and with all of the things that he's invested in Atlanta in terms of parks, in terms of uh, bringing neighborhoods up, in terms of children's education. I look at uh, Arthur and at the things he's done uh, in a similar way to help youth, to help uh, uh, disadvantaged uh, teenagers and others. And I look at the good decisions that people make out of having succeeded and knowing it's in their self-interest to contribute to their community, and I see magic. I'm not as complimentary of forced improvement of people's lives through central planning. I just, I haven't seen that work well. And uh, maybe I'll be, I'll see the light one day and I will see something positive achieved through that process, but I've seen a lot achieved through the private process and through the process of achievement and success. The last point, <clears throat> you've been through your career You've raised a family. You've created a certain amount of wealth. You've done your estate planning and you know how you want it to be used in your community and your family when you go. But you still have a lingering hunger or need before you go. And that hunger and that need is, did I make any mark at all on this world having been here? Was I a passenger on the train, or did I lead the train, or did I help build the train? What's my role, what, what was the point of my having been here? And if you've gone through a process of struggle, of achievement, of building, of collaborating, of building a family, building an employee network, building a successful business community and customer base around you, you have created a mark. You have made something good happen. And at the end of the day, legacy is an overused word, but making your mark on the world where you are remembered for what you did and how you left it is a important part of our life's cycle. And I think that it's only really possible to do that if you've been part of a process of building contribution and making a difference in other people's lives. You can't be a rider at the back of the bus and have everything provided and just kind of go along to go along and really leave much of a mark. You may have lived, you may have survived, you may have hung around, but you didn't accomplish much and the world doesn't really miss you when you're gone. And I think that's a tragedy when that happens. So that is pretty much the comments that I have uh, organized for you today. Um, I think that uh, we talked about having a little bit of question and answer session, so I'm more than happy to share any thoughts or insights that this may have provoked and uh, respond to any questions. Don't be bashful. Don't be bashful. Yeah. Steve, you mentioned that when you looked out into the audience and you saw like that energy or that spark and that's the person that you were wanting to connect with. Today, if you were, um, you know, looking at this audience and stuff, what kinds of attributes would you look for in a person that you would want to uh, bring up in your organization? Um, the simplest way to respond to that is to say that I or anybody who's involved in a mission, whatever that mission is, has very limited bandwidth. You really have only so much time available to you. So you're looking for a person who says, count me in. 
I'm interested. How can I help? You're looking for that reaction because you can't push success on people. They have to be hungry for it. They have to come to you and ask for it. And I will say that one business strategy in my career that worked better than any other strategy was I would look around in whatever business I was in for the star, for the guy making really great stuff happen. And I'd walk up to him and say, hi, I'm Steve Gross. I want to help you make more happen. I want to be part of your team and make you look great, make whatever your vision is happen and be part of the success of what you're creating. So you become the go-to guy around stars. And what happens is stars naturally rise. And over time, whatever position they leave, they put you in. And the rapid rise of success is being that, count, that person they can count on. They know that you're part of his team and you're, no, you're going to cover his back. You're going to make sure that the outcome occurs and you are the first person that he picks when he moves up the chain. So I found that connecting to star performers vastly accelerated my career. I mean, I, I wasn't a genius. I wasn't, uh, you know, uh, Whatever it was that created that, that ultra bright star, all I, I knew, all I had to do was make him more successful, fill in the holes, cover for the things he didn't have time for, make his job more effective, and make him move quicker. Quicker he moved, quicker I moved. And that was a really effective strategy. Other thoughts? Yes? I think the question is, uh, does struggling make you stronger and help you succeed quicker? Is that a fair? Yeah. Okay. Um, depends on the definition of struggle. Um, when I was struggling, didn't seem like it. I was just doing it. I remember when I started out my career, I moved back to Atlanta and was going to graduate school. And I was living in a one bedroom apartment <coughs> up in, uh, off near the river off of uh, Powers Ferry. A one bedroom apartment, furnished with one window, looking into a mud bank, $300 a month. And Looking back on it, that was probably struggling. At the time, it was really cool because I could walk down to the river. I could walk next door to the post apartments. It had all this, you know, beautiful uh, pools and pretty girls hanging around the, the pool. So I might have been struggling, but it didn't feel like it. Um, I might have been working 10 hour days, 12 hour days, sometimes even longer than that when there was a project. But it didn't feel like struggling. It was fun because you were kind of rising to the challenge. Somebody threw something in front of you and said, God, we've got to get this done by tomorrow. Can you help me? And because you're that go-to guy, you say, of course you can. We're going to make it happen. Let's do what we need to do. So was that struggling? Probably. But it didn't feel like it. Um, I think struggling may be partly in the attitude of you and the task. Struggling to me is going to work. I'll give you, I, I do remember struggling. Summer job. I was, at, uh, I was at Wake Forest working in the Defense Activity Division accounting office for three months and I sat in an office that had desks about this wide and there were like six or eight people at each desk and it was like six desks deep. <clears throat> Numbers would start off at the first of the month over here and I had a little adding machine that was like a, a combination lock. It was punch things. It'd go 
And I would do that eight hours a day, and then my numbers would come across the desk, and at the end of the month, they would all get totaled up, you know, at the end of the desk, would total each end of the desk, and it would come into a summary report that would then get taken over to the corner office where a guy, for one day a month, although he was there all 30 days, would look at those reports, and he would pass them on. I felt like I was dead. This was the most uh, awful environment and experience. And I'm sitting there with all these uh, graduates of colleges and master's degrees, and, and they're sitting right next to me. Show, 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 show. So at the end of three months, they had a going away party for me <laughs> as I'm going back to school. And they brought out a cake and everybody's you know, gosh, what a great experience it was having you here. And you could see the tears and the desperation in their eyes, knowing they had to stay <laughs> and I got to go. <laughs> that was struggling. <laughs> so I think whenever you're doing something you don't want to be doing for reasons that you don't want to be doing it, that's struggling to me. Does that answer it? Yeah. Uh, you mentioned about uh, how much you learn from your failure. And so my question was, what is your biggest regret in business and why? Mm -mm. Hmm. <clears throat> well, one of my hobbies is food and wine. And I have been part of a very high-end culinary group for about 30 years. It's out of France. It's worldwide. And it's something where you basically go six to eight times a year to a fine dining restaurant where the chef closes the restaurant, shows off, sommeliers pair the wines with each one of the, the courses, and everybody has a wonderful time. So getting in the habit of doing that, I started edging closer and closer towards why not have a restaurant? So with, uh, with friends and myself, we opened up a restaurant and wine retail location next to each other in Sandy Springs. And it was wonderful. We had a world-class chef. We had a beautiful restaurant. We had a party every night with our friends that we didn't have to cook for and we didn't have to clean up. But I was writing $20,000 a month checks for that privilege. And I kept saying, when's this going to make money? And the chef would go, oh, they all work this way. You got to you know, pay your dues before things really turn around and you make money. First year passes, $20,000 a month checks. I'm going, chef, when's it going to work? He says, oh, we're getting close. We're getting close. At the end of four years, after a little over a million dollars, I said, I give. Got no more. Can't do it. Now, do I resent having gone through that? No. But I learned how difficult the restaurant business is. I learned how many things are not in your control. When I'm living in a professional environment and I'm hiring CPAs out of college and they're professionally focused and into their career, you're gathering a lot of positive horsepower towards focus goals. You do project management, you get great things done, you get to charge a lot of money for it, and it's a great business. In the restaurant world, it's entirely different. The people are not there for careers in general. They're coming and going because they're at school, they're doing this, they're in between. So there's not that professional commitment. There's uncertainty about who's going to show up in the kitchen and in the front of the house. There are suppliers that show up with the wrong things at the wrong time. There are a million things that go wrong every day that are different. So you've got to be there 
constantly solving those problems and not having a general manager that you're paying fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars a year to, you've got to be doing that yourself. Well, I'm running an accounting firm. So I would show up at the restaurant every night at seven o'clock and leave at 1.30 or two. So I'm running two careers. I'm getting to work at seven in the morning and getting home about two o'clock at night and losing money along the way. That was a learning experience, an expensive one, but one that, uh, that I now have an appreciation for that industry. And one thing that Deborah and I do in Trusted CFO Solutions is we bring better practices to restaurants and to franchises. So we now have solutions that simplify how owners operate their restaurants, how they watch over what's happening. And I would not have had that perspective had I not lived through that debacle. So I would say that that would be high on my list. <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> on the one hand, it's a very competitive market. On the other hand, there is very little trained, highly skilled people in that market. There are a lot of people, but not a lot of skill or experience. So in the trusted CFO as an example, I'm hiring people that if I could have found in the accounting firm, I would have hired in a second, but I, they never showed up. I never had access to that kind of talent, talent that understood uh, data mapping, uh, IT, um, aligning information in multiple uh, uh, dimensions to, to do reports that were, that were on right, you know, real time out of the uh, transactions into KPIs and business intelligence. If I could have found that when I was in the accounting firm and I sold my interest to my younger partners a couple of years ago to do this, I would have been magic. But my antenna weren't good. And when I found those kinds of people and built a business around it, it's now transformational. But I'm still looking for people today because it's so rare a skill to have accounting, operations, and IT perspective in a digital virtual environment. So if any of y'all live in that world, come see me afterwards. Thank you. Thanks so much, Steve. What a pleasure to have you here today. Sure. And I, I love the stories on the front, and I had heard some of those stories, and, and they always add such color. But I also appreciate the points and the advice that you had for our students today. Thank you Thanks. so much. Thanks. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for being here today.